Hey everyone, in this video, we're going to cover the next set of hirelings included in the Riverfolk Hirelings Pack. Now what I love about this new hireling setup is that these little packets are just mini expansions that you can buy to introduce hirelings to your game of Root. So if you're not sure if you want to invest in the whole collection of hirelings, you can just pick up either the Riverfolk Hirelings Pack or the Underworld Hirelings Pack and these boxes include everything, and I do mean everything that you need in order to play a Hirelings game. And that's because what they include is all of the base Hirelings component, right? The Hirelings die, and then the control tokens, as well as these little score marker pieces that you put. So it has all the base components you need, as well as three different Hirelings. And remember, you only actually need three hirelings in order to play a full hirelings game. And what's cool about these expansion packs is they include the two corresponding hirelings that go in the Riverfolk expansion, right? So you have one that matches the Riverfolk company, one that matches the lizard cult. So you've got this, the best meeple in all of Root. I love it so much. The Riverfolk flotilla, it's kind of hard to say, as well as a new, what we call pink hireling in the form of these highway bandits, these little porcupine guys. And you might be thinking, wait, what expansion, what faction does that correspond to? Well, that's the thing about these new pink hirelings. They don't correspond to any faction, meaning if you draft one of these pink hirelings, there is no advanced setup card from that set of faction cards that you need to remove. And this means that you can just have these pink hirelings in many, many more games and not have it remove any single faction from your mix. This packet, obviously, if you're using these hirelings every time to get used to the hireling system, this will mean that you won't be able to play games with the Riverfolk Company or the Lizard Cult when you're using just these hirelings. And for that reason, if you're considering getting a pack of hirelings, I would suggest that you get the hirelings pack that corresponds to a, an expansion you don't currently own. So if you have the Riverfolk expansion, but you don't have the Underworld expansion, I would suggest getting the Underworld Hirelings pack. That way you can use the Mole and Crow uh, Hirelings, and it won't cause you any problems because you wouldn't be playing with the Underground Duchy or the Corvid Conspiracy anyway. So let's go in and take a deep look at how the three new hirelings, or really six if you include the demoted side, how they are played. The first hireling we're going to talk about is the Warm Sun Prophets, which of course is based on the Lizard Cult. So these four unassuming little goofy lizard meeples are actually terrifying, and you'll see why soon enough. So the setup is pretty simple. There is no decision making in the setup, it's just you place a Prophet Warrior in each clearing with a Ruin. So typically, when you're doing the draft of who is going to be setting up the Hirelings, you wouldn't choose this one as your Hireling to set up, since you don't actually have any kind of agency. Whoever picks it to set up is having no choice, they're just going to have to put one in all of the clearings with a Ruin, which are always fixed. And then you would go ahead and set up the Factions. Now that the factions have set up and have taken a few turns, somebody has earned the Warm Sun Prophets hireling. And let's go through how the rules interact. So the first thing is there's a little when hired symbol. So the moment that you gain the hireling, either from the supply or from another player, you check these instructions. And it says, if no Prophet Warriors are on the map, place a Prophet Warrior in any clearing. So if we look, there is... Well, there are three Prophet Warriors on the map, so you would just ignore this. But if ever the Warm Sun Prophets have been completely annihilated from the map and there are none left, you would just get to take one and put it on the map. But for now, since we don't have to abide by that, we just ignore that when we get it. And let's read the rules. So it's a once in daylight action, and it is incredible. Check this. Choose any player even the controller, so you get to choose yourself for this action. So choose any player with faction pieces in a clearing with a Prophet Warrior. 
So in this case, there are these three clearings with Prophet Warriors, and I may choose any player. Force them to battle there, or force them to move as many pieces as they can there to a clearing you choose, and battle in the destination if you want. You choose the defender. So this is the only hireling that allows you to force other players, or of course yourself, to take an action. And this is nuts because you can say, okay, if I'm the Marquise de Cat, I can choose this clearing because I have a Prophet Warrior here, and I can say I am forcing the Lord of the Hundreds to battle here. And you can choose for them to battle anyone that they're able to battle. So if they have a hireling that they control, they could not be battled. And the reason being is that force is this new keyword in the Marauder expansion that you're forcing another player to take an action and they have to follow the rules as if they were taking it themselves. So they cannot battle any pieces that are not enemies to themselves but you can force them to battle you. You can force them to battle your hirelings or another enemy if you're playing a three or four player game. Any action that would be legal for the opponent to take, you can force them to take using the Warm Sun Prophet action. So here's an example. I'm forcing the Lord of the Hundreds to battle my Cat Warrior here. Maybe I just want to use Field Hospitals and also maybe have them do a hit against me in this clearing. Zero, zero, okay, not a good example. But I could also force myself, this cat warrior, to battle my opponent. So that's a good way of getting some free actions for yourself if you just want to do a battle action. And remember, if I were to knock out a piece of cardboard, a building or a token, it's not actually the hireling that's doing the battle. It's me. It's my cat warrior that's doing the battle. So in this case, I would just lose a cat warrior and a Lord of the Hundreds warrior because it was the cat doing the battle. So I would still get victory points if I were to remove a piece of cardboard, which is really nice. However, I could not force myself to battle my own hireling because, of course, if it's not something that I could normally do, I can't force myself to do that. So force is just this new keyword you're going to have to get used to using. Additionally, as you remember from the instructions, I could force myself or the opponent to take a move action and then either battle in the destination clearing or don't. I'm essentially forcing the player, the faction, to do a lizard crusade. If you know how crusade works for the normal lizard cult, it's you may battle in place or you may move and then you may battle, kind of like in advance. And remember, look at this. It says, force them to move as many pieces as they can from there. In this situation, if I'm forcing the Lord of the Hundreds to move, I can force them to move like this. However, I could not force the Warlord himself or herself to move because that is a rule of the Warlord. The Warlord cannot be moved outside of their own turn, meaning I could take a fully well-defended Warlord and just whoop, move all their guys over here. I can choose to have them battle me in this case, or probably not, because they would be the attacker, they would get the high roll. So I probably would just move them, choose not to attack, and then, because it's a once in daylight action, I can use a normal Marquise de Cat action to just battle this now defenseless Warlord. Ha ha! That's a good price to pay. So these are all kinds of amazing interactions that you can do using the Warm Sun Prophets, but be very careful because remember, let's go reset this. You cannot battle your own hirelings. So in this situation here, I've got these two cat warriors protecting the keep, two buildings, and a wood token. I cannot battle this Warm Sun Prophet warrior, which is a big problem because at some point, I'm going to have to hand this hireling card off to an opponent, probably the Lord of the Hundreds, at which point, yes, now this hireling is no longer an enemy to me, so I could battle it, but I've just ended my turn, so I cannot battle it until my next turn. But then it might be too late, because the Lord of the Hundreds can now use this hireling to force 
my warriors to move out of the clearing, leaving a whole clearing full of cardboard now completely defenseless because you have to move all of the warriors that you are able to. So if there are two or three or even seven cats defending an area, it does not matter. The Warm Sun Prophets can force all of them to move out and expose the rest of your cardboard. So you have to keep that in mind and be careful. If there is a Warm Sun Prophets warrior on top of some precious infrastructure, you may want to battle it before you actually gain the hireling. So if it's still in the supply, if it hasn't been claimed yet by anyone or it's been claimed by an enemy, you're still able to battle it. You should probably do so before it's too late. Okay. Then the other effect that the Warm Sum Prophets has is, or if you choose not to do that whole force conspiracy thing, place a Prophet Warrior in a clearing without one. So if ever, you know, you wanted to get a Warm Sum Prophets Warrior somewhere else, I could place it here and then very sneakily do this action and then hand it to that player in order that they would not be able to remove it until it leaves their control. So you can really give people nightmares with these Warm Sun Prophets uh, warriors, and that's why it has this effect of when you hand it to someone or when someone gains it, you get to just place one for free the moment that you claim it. All right, so be very careful of the Warm Sun Prophets. They are a wild and crazy effect. Additionally, remember that the card says force them to move as many pieces there as they can. So in this situation, we have two Keepers and Iron Warriors defending a relic. Because relics can be moved, they must go with the moved Keepers and Iron Warriors if I'm using this Warm Sun Prophets effect. So I could say I'm using the action to move all of the keepers and iron pieces over to here. I cannot decide to leave the relic behind and then just attack it for points once it's no longer defended. Because relics are the only non-warrior pieces that can move, they must, okay? So even though sometimes you might think, oh, wood is moving, it's traveling around the map in order to make buildings, the wood tokens are not physically moving, so they cannot be moved. Only the relics are the tokens that can be moved by the Warm Sun Prophets. Let's turn now to the demoted side of the Warm Sun Prophets, which is Lizard Envoys. This is a start of birdsong effect, so it has to be the first thing you do on your turn. Controller, this is an ability, of the, it's always gonna say controller on the demoted side. You may search the top five cards in the discard pile and take a card of the most common suit except an ambush. So this is kind of replicating the effect of the outcast and the lost souls that the lizards have, this involvement with the discard pile. So I'm really interested in how they've done this. So in this case, the top five cards are kind of like the lost souls because it's a temporary discard and it involves something that's the most common suit. Now here's an additional thing. You cannot count bird cards as other suits and you decide on suit ties. So in this situation, the bird cards do count as a fourth suit, so you would just count them as their own entire suit. So let's look at using this action. For this reason, you should try to not shuffle around the discard pile. Normally it doesn't matter, but when this hireling is in play, you should try to keep them in the order that they were discarded in so as to not uh, mess that up. But interestingly, when you discard cards from the decree, all of them are considered to have been discarded at the same time. So when that happens, you could theoretically just shuffle around the order of the cards in your decree, place them in the order that you wish, or do them one at a time in order to kind of game the top of the discard pile to your favor. So let's go ahead and search the top five cards. One, oh, let's keep them in order. Two, three, four, five. So in this situation, let's lay them out. We have Bird Ambush, Coffin Makers, League of Adventurous Mice, Soup Kitchens, and Travel Gear. So what is the first thing? What is the most common suit? Well, we have a tie. It's Bird and Mouse. So we right away cannot choose Coffin Makers. And of course, it says we cannot choose Ambush Cards. So right off the top, we cannot choose these ones. 
And because we get to decide on ties, we can declare, in this case, the bird suit is the most common, and I choose to take soup kitchens, if that's what you wish to do. Or you can say, I'm choosing mouse to be the most common suit, and I'm going to go ahead and take this boot. So in this situation, you actually have a quite a lot of choice as to which card you're going to take because of the whole discard or choosing what the most common suit is in the event of a tie. If ever there are three of the same, like three mouse cards and two rabbits or one rabbit, one fox, then obviously you can't choose. It has to be one of those mouse cards. So this situation is kind of the most ideal since there are two of a suit and two of another. That means you can effectively choose four out of those five cards to be the one that you're going to take. Obviously, ambushes notwithstanding because you can't take those. Then once you've made the decision, you have to carefully put them back into the discard pile, try to maintain the order that they were in, in order to maintain the integrity of this ability. Lizard Envoys, very cool. The next hireling we're going to discuss is the Riverfolk Flotilla. This is one of my favorites, partially because the ability itself is really cool, and it comes with the greatest meeple in all of Root! Ah! So, let's go ahead and talk about the setup. It's really simple. You just place the flotilla pawn in a clearing on the map edge and river. So, of course, I have all of these pieces already set up from the previous example. So just imagine that no one has set up yet because when you're doing the hireling setup, the factions haven't even been revealed yet. So the person who chooses to set up the Riverfolk flotilla is going to choose a river clearing, any of these, but it also has to be on the map edge. So that eliminates all three of these central. Oh, well, actually, this one's on the map edge. So I could choose this to be the starting clearing of the Riverfolk flotilla, or here, or here. Those are the three options. So let's go ahead and just choose this clearing as the starting clearing of the Riverfolk flotilla. Then, once the game has kind of gone underway and someone has claimed the River Folk Flotilla, let's see what it does. So first of all, the rule of the River Folk Flotilla, I'm just gonna say the flotilla, Blah. The flotilla cannot be battled or removed. In battle, the flotilla can roll up to three hits. So if you remember from the setup instructions, it is a pawn, the same as the Vagabond, right? So this is a pawn, it does not contribute to rule one way or the other, and even though it's in a clearing, it cannot be battled. You cannot decide to battle against it because it has no ability to do any damage. So you just cannot initiate a battle against the flotilla. But it can battle you. And it can always roll up to three hits. Okay? So let's go through the action. So once somebody has this hireling, it's a start of birdsong action, so you have to do this right away, and it says each player with a faction pieces at the flotilla may draw a card. That's really cool. So in this situation, whether I am the Marquise the Cat, am the controller or not, at the start of whoever's turn that has the Riverfolk flotilla as their controlled hireling, I get to draw a card. So that's really nice. It's almost like an effect of woohoo! the Riverfolk Company being in the game, where its presence allows people to have more liberal acquisition of cards, what's really nice. The timing of this is something to keep in mind. So because it's at the start of the controller's birdsong, you may want to position one of your faction pieces in the flotilla's clearing in order to benefit so that once their turn comes around, you're just going to get to draw a free card. Additionally, you might say, well, before that player's turn, maybe I'm going to remove all of the faction pieces from the flotilla's clearing to prevent you from getting a free card draw. Huzzah! So think about that when the flotilla is in effect. It, that card draw benefit benefits anybody that starts in the flotilla's clearing, not just the controller. That's really cool. And it's a may draw card. I don't know why you wouldn't, but yeah you could decide not to draw a card. And then the second effect is a must effect. You actually do have to do this. You must move the flotilla along the river, ignoring rule. 
So yes, you get to move the flotilla along the river. I like that even in a game without the Rufo company being involved, its hireling equivalent still makes the river somewhat interactive. So if I am an opponent of the Marquise de Cat, I'm probably gonna move it like this, and then optionally, the flotilla may battle. So no matter what you do, if you're the controller, you must dole out the cards to whoever is in the clearing where it started, and then you must move it along the river, either to here or to here. So if I choose to move it over to here, then I decide if I want to have the flotilla battle an enemy. And if I am battling, if I'm an opponent of the Marquise de Cat, I'm definitely gonna choose to do a battle right here at this clearing. So we're gonna roll. 1-0. Ah, that's sad. So the flotilla deals up to three rolled hits, so it's going to hit one Marquise de Cat warrior, and even if it were a 3-3 three, three or something like that, the flotilla cannot sustain any damage. It has nothing to damage, so the cats that are doing hits back to it in defense don't actually do anything. So there is no consequence on those defensive rolls. Now, importantly, you may still decide to play an ambush card. It won't do anything, but you can decide to play it if it's what you need to do to affect the lost souls. But it's kind of an expensive price for just moving the outcast to a different suit. I would probably not do it, but that's how the Riverfolk Flotilla works. It's dishing out cards to everybody, and it's just moving up and down the river, smacking people around left and right kind of like a merchant slash mercenary pirate hybrid. It is insane, and I really like when this hireling is in play. The Riverfolk Flotilla. The demoted side of the Riverfolk Flotilla is Otter Divers, and it's very simple. It's just one sentence. It's, you ignore rule when moving to or from a clearing on the river. I think this is probably one of the most misunderstood rules because people get this and they assume it means like riverboats when the riverfolk company is in play, you can move along the river. That's not at all what it says. It says you ignore rule when moving to or from a clearing on the river. No mention of moving along the rivers. It just means that you can ignore rule if you are leaving a river clearing along the normal paths or you are going into a clearing along the river. This is still a really cool ability because it's effectively like having Corvid planners whenever you're moving to or from a clearing that's on the river. And on the autumn map, there are a lot of clearings that have the river present. So in this situation, if I'm the Marquise de Cat and I'm in this clearing, I don't rule this clearing. I don't rule this clearing. I don't rule this clearing. But because I'm on the river, I can move from the river to this spot right here if I have otter divers or vice versa. I can say I'm moving like this one. I don't rule this clearing, ignore this clearing. But if I'm moving to a clearing on the river, I get to ignore rule. So that's what it does. It seems underwhelming, but for someone like the Woodland Alliance or any other faction that can have a lot of difficulty moving about, being able to ignore rule is really, really strong. And even though, yes, it does center around the rivers and doesn't allow you to access more points, it's almost like a fusion of boat builders and corvid planners. It just gives you a lot of movement opportunities in games where rule is contested. So keep your eye on this and be really careful when your opponents get this because that means they can undertake a lot of different maneuvers you might not expect. Otter divers. And the last hireling in the Rear Folk Hirelings pack is Highway Bandits. Their setup is gonna give something very interesting away right away. Place two bandits, one each on a path without one. Yes, this is the first type of piece that's gonna inhabit the paths. This is the first time we've seen this in Root. So we're gonna set up the game, obviously, before all the factions have done all this stuff. And they're going to go one on a path, and you can never have two on the same path. So then the second one is going to be placed somewhere over here. So on the onset of the game, before you even know what factions are in play, be very careful of where you put these, because the implications of highway bandits is nuts. 
let's read what the two little uh, global abilities are. The first one says, when an enemy moves on a path with a bandit, they must remove one moving piece or damage one item if they're the vagabond. That, think about that. So anytime an enemy moves along a path where there's a bandit warrior, you have to remove one of your pieces. So if I had this Marquise de Cat warrior, and I don't know if I were like this, I wanted to move from here to here, there would be no point in doing that because the minute it crosses this bandit warrior, it is removed from the game and I wouldn't even be able to place it in this clearing. So that is devastating when you're not the controller. And remember, an uncontrolled hireling is still considered an enemy to you and the game starts with two of them on the map. So until somebody claims the highway bandits, both of these two starting highway bandit warriors are going to be causing problems for everybody until it's claimed. And because you cannot actually initiate a battle on a path, you can only battle inside clearings, you can never battle the highway bandits. They're just going to be there. There is a way to move them, but you can never remove them from the game once they're around. But there is another couple of weird effects that you need to be aware of. So how does this interact with field hospitals? Well, let's read this text a little bit more carefully. When an enemy moves on a path with a bandit, they must remove one moving piece or damage one item. They're not removing it from the origin or destination. They're removing it along the path. And of course, a path doesn't have a suit. So you do not get to rescue any warriors from the Marquise de Cat that are removed by using field hospitals. So that's really rough. Another crazy interaction with this is the wording. Remove one moving piece. Wait a second, it says piece, not warrior. And that's because relics are moving pieces. You might not ever want to do this, but it could happen, especially if you were forced to move via false orders or the warm sun prophets. But if you are the badgers and you're moving along a path with a highway bandit, you could, of course, remove one warrior and you would probably want to do that. Or you could remove the relic. But guess what? The rules for prize trophies, which is a, glo um, a faction ability of the Keepers in Iron, says whenever an enemy removes a relic, they score two points and then it goes back to the forests wherever they choose. But when this is happening, it's not an enemy that's removing it. It's actually you. You, the keepers in iron, are the ones removing this relic. So what happens to this relic if it's removed by a highway bandit? It is completely removed from the game because prize trophies doesn't exist for this purpose. It doesn't activate. That is unbelievable. If you thought there was no way to remove relics because of prize trophies, you'd be wrong. This hireling can completely mess up the keepers in iron if they're moving with just one warrior, right? Obviously you would elect to remove the warrior, but if ever you decided that you really needed to save this warrior and you were going to remove this relic, it is just gone from the game, back in the box, erased from existence. So be aware of that absolutely crazy rules interaction with uh, the keepers in iron and the highway bandits. However, this is not all doom and gloom because there is a second uh, hireling ability and it says the controller gets this power. When you move on a path with a bandit as the controller, you may place a warrior in the destination clearing. <gasps> Whoa! So for factions that are very, very keen on recruitment, for whom recruitment is expensive, like the Keepers in Iron, or the Woodland Alliance, or the Riverfolk Company, moving along a path, I know this move was illegal, moving along a path with a highway bandit while you're in control of the highway bandit means that you get to recruit a warrior. 
That is insane. So think about someone who has a bunch of free move actions like the Eerie Dynasties when it has a whole bunch of movement. You could just go one, add a warrior, two, add a warrior, three, add a warrior, and just stack up your warrior count just by moving across the Howie Bandits when you're in control of this. So be aware when you're giving it to an opponent how able they will be to take advantage of this extra recruitment. That is really, really cool in my opinion. Um, but we haven't even talked about the once in daylight effect. The once in daylight, the physical action you can take when you're in control of the Howie Bandits is place a bandit on a path without one. Okay, of course, we have two more that are in the supply that weren't placed upon setup. So once in daylight, you can say, I'm going to place this bandit warrior here. So place a bandit on a path without one. You can never double them up. Link to a clearing with your faction pieces. So in this situation, if I'm the Marquise de Cat, I cannot place the bandit warrior up here because neither of the adjacent clearings to this path have my faction pieces. So I can put it along most of the paths, I cannot put it here, and I cannot put it here or here. Okay, so be aware of that. It has to be linked to your faction pieces. And it says, if no bandits are in the supply, you may move one in order to place it. So if one gets placed here and another gets placed here, then at this point, none are in the supply. So at some point, if some player takes this action, they can decide, okay, there are none in the supply. I'm going to move this one and place it over here. So that's how they would move around. Once all four of them are on the map, they're going to stay on the map. There's no way to remove them from play. They're gonna be there forever, but their positions can move around on the paths. So that is the Highway Bandits. Absolutely insane interaction potential, very cool. The demoted side of the Highway Bandits is called the Bandit Gangs. And it might look really similar, but notice that it's the demoted side. And right away, it says, if no bandit warriors, wait, 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 wait. I thought demoted hirelings don't use any warriors or pieces. And that's true for most of the hirelings, the ones that are based on factions, right? The promoted sides use the pieces and warriors that are included in the box. And the demoted sides are just abilities that don't use pieces. But for all of the pink hirelings, of which we're gonna talk about in future videos, both the promoted and the demoted, this little D, both of the sides of the card use the hireling, warriors and or pawns, pieces, whatever have you. So I think that's really cool about the pink hirelings as well. You're always gonna see some type of board presence in addition to the ability. There is no setup instructions for this hireling. It's just gonna start the game and you're gonna go through the game until someone claims it. The moment that you acquire the hireling, it says when acquired, if no bandit warriors are on the map, which is always gonna be the case the first time someone grabs it from the supply, place one in a clearing with your faction pieces. So if I'm the cats, I claim this hireling and I do the when hired action, which is I can take one of the bandit warriors and place it in any clearing where I have faction pieces. So that could be buildings, tokens, or warriors. I'm gonna place it at the keep. Now, of course, remember that the rule of the keep is that enemies may not place pieces here, but this hireling is not an enemy to me. So I can actually place my own hirelings in the keep if I so choose. It's pretty cool. Now, let's look at what the special rule is. Bandit warriors cannot be battled in clearings with their factions, their controller's faction pieces. So as long as I have faction pieces, my cat pieces, in this clearing, the opponents, like the Lord of the Hundreds, cannot battle this hireling, the bandit gang's warrior. They have to completely remove all of my pieces, which is usually hard to do at the keep. They have to remove all of my pieces before they can start targeting the highway bandit. But why would you want to have your faction pieces protecting a hireling? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Well. Obviously, that's a leading question. Let's see what the once in daylight action is. So once in daylight, you may place a faction warrior of the controller at each bandit warrior. Ah, so it helps you with recruitment. So without wasting any of your faction's action potential, you can say, okay, at each 
location where there is a bandit warrior, I can place one of my faction warriors. Obviously, this pays off a lot more when you have all four of the warriors placed. So I can say, okay, first one, place a faction warrior of the controller, that's me, at each bandit warrior. So then I get to go, okay, place one here, one here, one uh, here, and one here. So we're seeing this theme of both sides of the bandit gangs of really rapid warrior acquisition, right? So that is the first option of your once in daylight action is adding more of your own faction warriors to the locations where you've got bandit warriors or place a bandit warrior in a clearing with a faction piece of the controller. So this is how you actually arrive at this point. At the start, when you acquire it, you only get one, but then you do one turn where instead of recruiting, you might choose to do the second option, which is place a bandit warrior in a clearing where I have my faction pieces. So I could not place it here, of course. I could choose to place one here. And then on a following turn, I could place it here. And then on a following turn after that, that's the turn I might decide to add some recruitment of my own warriors. But the problem is, of course, when you're in the lead, the first person to gain the hireling from the supply, they're generally only gonna have it for one or two turns. So are you really gonna invest in setting up the hireling for two turns in a row? It's your choice. But keep in mind, once the hirelings are there, there they will stay until your faction pieces are entirely removed. So no one is gonna be able to battle the hireling warriors until all your faction pieces are removed, but it only blocks them from battling. Keep in mind that a removal effect, like a revolt or a bomb or something that removes enemy pieces could still remove the bandit warriors. It's just you cannot target them in a battle if their controller has any faction pieces in that clearing. And that's that for all of the hirelings that are included in the Riverfolk Hirelings pack. Like I said, it includes three hirelings. Of course, there's the promoted and demoted side that you can play around with and it includes all of the hireling pieces that you need in order to actually utilize the system. So if you buy everything, you'll have a bunch of sets of these that might be just good replacements. And I really recommend picking up this hireling pack first. It has some of my favorite wacky hireling interactions that you can see with the system, including this forced movement and forced battling with the Warm Sun Prophets and this whole interaction with the paths, with the highway gangs, and the river becoming relevant again for the Riverfolk Flotilla, as well as playing around with positioning to gain extra cards and just throwing a warship ah, at your enemy along the river. And it makes the river both a lucrative place to be, but also a dangerous place to be. So I highly recommend checking this out if you're on the fence about hirelings, maybe pick up either the hirelings, uh, one of the small hirelings packs, the Riverfolk, or Underworld hirelings packs to try it out. And if you're like me and you're totally sold on the hirelings, you'll probably just end up getting them all anyway. So thank you very much. I'll see you guys next time.